Thank you for joining me. My name is Jennifer Kirschenbaum. Many of you I know. Today we're going to be discussing getting ready for 2015 HIPAA breach reporting. This is a very important topic. It's a very large area of audit. And I'm glad that you're joining me to learn a little bit more about it today. Before I get started, I'll say a couple of brief words about our firm. Many of you are familiar with our firm and are familiar with me. We have a general counsel style approach to representation, and we represent healthcare practitioners across the country. We are based in New York and New Jersey, um, and we do uh, corporate and regulatory compliance work pretty much everywhere, and we actually do uh, litigation consulting work nationally as well. So um, any questions you have throughout your practice, you can always feel free to call me. Uh, really, anything that comes up, um, we, can, we can usually give you some advice or we try to assist you to find the right professional to help you if we're not the right person or firm. Okay, so for today's discussion, the reason why I scheduled this webinar is oftentimes I find myself asked by my clients, Jennifer, what are your major concerns for me? What really could be a practice killer to wipe me out? I want to know from your perspective. Well, there's a couple that, that pop up to mind for me right off the bat, and you see them here on our slide. A government investigation where a U.S. attorney is involved or even a DA at the state level is decimating and can be very, very disruptive, obviously anxiety-ridden for the practitioners involved. Um, if it's public, obviously the patients can be discouraged from coming. So oftentimes here, it's, if you're accused, you're, you're seen as guilty. And it could have a deleterious impact to your practice right off the bat. Government investigation I put as a general category. But I see OSHA and HIPAA a bit as a TIA as opposed to a full-scale heart attack. Um, uh, an OSHA investigation, depending on what the complaint is, normally can be handled um, and controlled. Same thing with HIPAA, which we're going to get into really today. You're going to see what's going on with the Office for Civil Rights and the HIPAA exposure. So I like to tell you that these areas are concerned, as well as the other two, Medicare audit and employee class action, we'll get to those in a second, can be handled and controlled with preventative compliance. The Medicare audit situation, if you are taking Medicare and it's a big portion of your ARs and you're a participating doc, of course, um, and you end up in a recovery audit contract or dispute on prepayment review and, and post-pay audit, you really could have a, a practice ending situation with receivables. And the best way to prepare for that is really to work with a certified coder and make sure that your documentation is proper. Um, and then you really won't have much to worry about, um, honestly. So it's all preventative. But that's not what today's lecture is on. Employee class action is also another big issue I had to bring up. It doesn't necessarily have to be a class action to have concern over it. If employees are leaving and are looking to be disruptive, they may very well succeed. Um, and these are some major areas that I see that are none of them you see are related to patient care because we all have adequate insurance um, in most instances, to cover from potential exposure from a, malpra a malpractice claim. Now, the employee class action situation, you can carry employment practices liability insurance, um, which I recommend. And that's the tip I'll give you there before we move on. So today's lecture is on HIPAA. And I find it helpful to just give a brief reminder on what that is. And HIPAA is a federal law comprised of three different parts. There's a privacy rule, which is our typical HIPAA that was implemented in 1996 that we're all familiar with. Then there's security rule and the breach notification rule, which is what we're going to get into a lot today. The security rule was put into place to deal with the internet and our use of the internet and electronic health records, which a lot of us are now using in some form or another. Most of us are submitting electronic claims. And if we're not to that stage, even storing information on a computer is considered electronic and would implement the security rule. The breach notification rule is what it sounds like. There's a requirement to notify the government if there is a breach. And we're going to get into what that means, and that's the purpose of our lecture today. 
This is from the government that HIPAA is balanced so that it permits the disclosure of personal health information needed for patient care and other important purposes, and we'll get into what that means so that way we can quiet certain concerns about use and access to information while also discussing how to better protect your practices on a going forward basis. Who has to abide by HIPAA? Everyone on this call most likely, that's why you're listening, but any healthcare provider, and by extension, a healthcare provider's business associate. So business associates are not named as required to abide as a covered entity, but by extension and their access, they are impl um, uh, sorry, implicated under the statute. And we haven't seen a business associate yet called to task and required to pay money to the Office for Civil Rights, but I would bet that that's going to happen in the next year or two. Um, so business associates on our call, I do work with a lot of billing companies. Um, I'm affiliated with HBMA, um, the National Billing Company Association. I do recommend that you comply with what we're talking about today. It is required. What is protected under HIPAA? I'm going to make it really simple for you. It's any individually identifiable health information is what's considered protected as protected health information. So what does that mean? It means anything you can trace back to a patient. So a name, social security number, driver's license identification number, picture, all of that is protected. Phone number, email address, and certainly the medical information that corresponds with that individual is also um, meant to be protected. So for those of us who are doing obscure, I don't say obscure, but using um, information that may be obscure, let's say an identifier on an implant, a number that comes on an implant that's in a patient, that might be traceable back to a patient, and itself, the actual implant with the identifier could possibly be considered protected health information. So x-rays also, if there's something unique enough that you find on a patient, if that standalone without a patient identifier that you're seeing on there um, could possibly you know, fall under very much so without any other attachment, patient name or number, as individually identifiable information. Um, so really, it's very broad, and it captures anything that could possibly be traced back to one person. Now, for your uh, benefit, I did put on here a couple of areas that are not included as protected health information. So education records, that's, that's uh, records that a um, education institution would be maintaining, not a um, uh, practice. Employment records, also these are separate from medical records, not a medical record. And a person who's been deceased for more than 50 years, this is new for the law. These are not considered protected under HIPAA. Today's purpose is we're going to be talking about breach reporting. That's what I advertise, and that's what we're going to be speaking about. Um, HIPAA requires, this is new, as of September 23, 2013, that breach uh, be reported to the Office for Civil Rights, which is, for all intents and purposes, the secretary. Um, of HHS for, our, for reporting purposes for HIPAA. Now, what is a breach is integral to our reporting requirement, of course. And I want to be really careful here. If any of you plan on using the information from this lecture for employee training, you have to be very careful because how we classify and name a breach will, in fact, actually arm our employees to have, quote, unquote, the goods on us. And I think we have to be really careful about what, how we classify as a red flag being raised for possible misuse of protected health information versus using the word breach. And I want to be really clear about that. So we're going to get through what a breach is versus what it is not. And you'll see that the lines are really nuanced and that we shouldn't be cavalier about assigning the word breach. Because once we use that word, that automatically means that we have an obligation as the covered entity and the holder, custodian of the protected health information to do something once there is a classified breach. So be very, very careful with the use of that word. And when you, when you do do training, if you're not working with a professional, a healthcare attorney, um, or uh, an authorized trainer on HIPAA, and even if you are working with an authorized trainer on HIPAA, just be wary that you don't want to use the word breach in a cavalier manner. So the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure 
of protected health information in a manner not permitted by HIPAA is a breach. So any use that is not authorized, which we'll go through authorized uses quickly, um, and you know, in a brief manner. If you have any questions, you should always call me or email me, and we'll use it possibly for the listserv. Um, please be careful here with breach. What is authorized? Well, we all have our privacy notices on hand. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we have appropriate documentation when patients come in. And we know that our privacy policy, if it's, a, if it's a proper one done, if you have questions or concerns about yours, please ask me offline. Um, uses and disclosures that are authorized are, of course, to the patient, to a patient authorized representative, for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations purposes, pursuant to a valid authorization from the patient, by agreement from the patient, and also, there are certain instances where you're required to disclose, okay? Um, and that's usually to the government or by court order. For treatment and payment purposes, you are allowed to release a minimum necessary to the party that you are um, engaging with for payment or for treatment to a practitioner that you're possibly referring the patient to or another practitioner who is asking for records known to you and you've confirmed how you're transferring, that is authorized under HIPAA. What is excluded as a breach, other than what we just talked about, is unintentional access for someone who works for you, okay, acting in their capacity, where there was a good faith access. There's no bad faith here. You're not treating a celebrity and the admin at your front desk aren't looking up this person's records for fun, um, possibly posting on Facebook, which of course would be egregious. Um, so it's within the scope of their authority and does not result in further use or disclosure. That would not be a breach. Now, when we talk about a workforce member, we're talking about an employee, someone who is directly under your control and supervision. And this person or these people should be signing off on some sort of agreement with your office that they will be bound and adhere to the rules of HIPAA related to patient information while they work with you. And this is something you have to have on file and it should be in writing. So this way you can document it. It has to be in writing. An independent contractor is not under your scope uh, of review, is working independently, and is not under supervision, and would not be covered um, as a workforce member here unless we have properly included them by contract and you need to make sure you have that in place. Also excluded from a breach is a disclosure from one authorized person to another authorized person. So this I would like to highlight for you as one doctor referring to another doctor for care purposes. So this would not be a breach. It's an authorized transfer. According to the statute, you don't need a release. Um, you don't need the patient's signature. You can send the information over, and you are OK. Third, a disclosure of protected health information where a covered entity or business associate has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was made would not unreasonably have, would not reasonably have been able to retain such information. So this is where. I'll give you an example. We give a discharge form to the wrong patient in the waiting room. The person is holding the information, has, has not really looked at it and put it in their bag. We realize we did this, and someone chases after the patient in the hallway and gets back the discharge form so it's been recovered. Well, the patient has not looked at it and was not aware so this also could potentially be excluded as a quote unquote breach. Fourth on our list, and this one requires an analysis, is where there is a low probability of the protected health information being compromised. So let's get into it here. Where there's a prohibited use or disclosure, there's a breach unless the covered entity, and this would be by an analysis, can demonstrate 
that there's a low probability that protected health information has been compromised based on a risk assessment of at least the following factors. And the risk assessment has to be documented in writing to show that you actually did it. You're going to look at the nature and extent of the protected health information, what was involved, what kind of identifiers, who actually got the information, who are the unauthorized people. Was the protected health information actually acquired or viewed? And to what extent did you mitigate the exposure? Now, certainly you can engage in this risk assessment internally. You also can work with your healthcare attorney and have it written up with an analysis. We can parse words or have different opinions on which one is safer. But of course, coming from the healthcare attorney, I believe that if you actually have a breach or, or a suspected breach, you should be working with your attorney, it should be documented appropriately, and the risk assessment should be done by your counsel. So you have it on paper and on file appropriately, and we make an educated decision as to whether or not there's a responsibility to report any kind of breach or anything to any patients, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, just a note for those of you interested, this is a new analysis required. Used to be there was a breach if there was an actual harm, if there was some sort of monetary or damage done to a patient because of a breach. This factor set does not take into account whether there was actual quote unquote damage it has to do with whether the information was compromised. So we've moved away from the privacy rule in 1996, their standard of harm, to this new standard of what was compromised and was the compromise actually retained by the wrong person. And if so, that triggers a reporting obligation by the covered entity. Who do I have to notify? Well. There's breach requirements of having to notify the Office for Civil Rights, which we talked about earlier. There's two kinds of breach categories. One is for a big breach, where more than 500 individuals are affected. The other is a small, where there's less than 500 individuals affected, and there's going to be different rules for each. Now, if we lose a laptop or a thumb drive, that's carrying a lot of information on a lot of patients. It's very easy to get over that 500 precipice. What you probably are assuming we're getting to is there are fines now if you are not in compliance. And there are settlements that are going on right now with the Office for Civil Rights with entities that have been reported to them for breaches. The amount of a fine does not really matter um, based on how big the size of the breach was. The entity's exposure, the practice's exposure, is going to depend on how much preventative you have in place and what you've done to mitigate exposure. That's why proactive compliance in this realm is so critical. Because if you do have a massive breach, if you address it immediately, assuming it's known to you, you will be free, presumably, the way that the structure is set up, from exposure because you address it properly and you have protocols in place. We'll get to examples of breaches later where you'll see that the comments by the Office for Civil Rights is they had no infrastructure in place, no policies in place, no agreements with employees, and this is why they have to pay this fine. And that's really important here, because I want to make sure that this is not a scary webinar for you. You understand that if you're listening and you're looking to be compliant, and we put in place a couple of few preventative um, policies and procedures, we can save on the, on the back end a lot. The big breach notification is different than the small breach notification. If there's a big breach and you have an employee who loses a laptop, First, let me say really importantly, the employees have to understand that they have an obligation to report. And if that's not in writing between you and the employee, 
that they have an immediate obligation to report if they lose uh, protected health information or if they think they may have compromised protected health information. And you don't have ways for them to report anonymously or without retribu retribution, then right there we have a problem. So that has to be set up internally. Um, and we, we can help with that if you need. Now, if there's a big breach, you have to provide notice to the patients immediately or at least within 60 days. And you have to provide what information was compromised. And this can be done to the patient's address um, or by email if email is authorized. Now, for using email with patients, this is another tip. Please make sure that we have in the patient's um, handwriting or authorized by signature the email address on file that they have given you. You may want a statement that they have sole and exclusive use or that they consent to any and all um, information being transmitted to them by email. Um, and whether or not they have other people looking at the email is going to be their issue. What if we don't have the patient's information anymore for some reason? This would be bizarre, obviously, because you've been treating them. But if it's been a long time, let's say you have records on file for more than for, for six years or more, patients have moved, um, you're required to post notification of the breach on your home page for at least 90 days or provide notice in the major print or, or broadcast media. You're also to provide a toll-free number for at least 90 days where individuals can learn that the information um, has been out. We're also required in a big breach to have media notice. Um, and media outlets will uh, assist you uh, upon proper contact. And of course, you should be working with your health care counsel if, if you're in a situation where there's a large breach. Um, and this should not be unreasonably delayed. You have to provide the media notice in 60 days. Oops. Notice to the secretary. If it's more than 500, you have to provide notice immediately. You have to report, and we'll go through the reporting process within 60 calendar, calendar days to the secretary. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. This is the purpose of the webinar, um, is that there is a responsibility by the end of the year, within 60 days of the end of each calendar year, to provide notice to the secretary of any breaches fewer than 500 individuals. Now, you can report at the time that it happened, but I want to use the end of the year, and this time around November, Thanksgiving is coming up, Christmas is on its way, to bring to attention that we have these obligations and we have to be tracking our use and access and potential disclosure of protected health information. It's incredibly important to have this on our calendar as this time of year where we do an assessment. And the reason for that is, we've already gone over a number of reasons, but because if we don't have a regimented, um, proactive, preventative plan in place uh, for these, these HIPAA potential violations, then we're leaving ourselves out for exposure. And I want to make sure that we have calendared around this time of year to make sure we have our assessments compiled. We know what we have to report. Because here's the deal. If you have patients reporting to OCR that you have a breach and you yourself have not accounted for that at the end of the year, we're going to be in much bigger trouble than is necessary. So, I want to take us through, and excuse my screen here, the breach notification. I think this will be helpful. This is the Office for Civil Rights website. I'm in the Health Information Privacy section on the breach notification page. I hope I don't get in trouble for this. I filled out an erroneous uh, form here that I haven't submitted, of course. But this is what it looks like to um, tell the secretary that you've had a breach. Now, again, remember, we've already classified the disclosure as a breach, which the, the disclosures that you have that cannot be classified as a breach obviously is to your benefit. We do not want to have to have an obligation to report where we don't have to. So working with your healthcare attorney and getting a risk assessment done in a way where we can show that there was no um, information retained by the receiving party or none in a way that hasn't been recovered um, and not compromised. That's the key, is to get the risk assessments done in a way that we can show in writing and keep on file that really we've done everything internally, we have all of our policies and procedures, 
We know that there was a disclosure, but that that disclosure is not tantamount to a breach, and here's why. And that's what has to be in the risk assessment. So this is what the first page is. <clears throat> We're making an initial breach report. Whoops. Oh, I'm sorry. My, I've timed out here. Okay, so let's go through it really quickly. We're going to say that we're a covered entity filing for our organization, and our covered entity name is going to be here. Our type of covered entity is going to be here. And I just want to take you through the first page since it's saved inappropriately here. Um, I had it in here, and I didn't realize it would time out. So make note that if you're filling this out for yourself, that this will time out. Okay? So I'm going to just fill this out. Uh, in my email address, and I'll put in my phone number in case they want to call me. I'm not a covered entity, so I don't believe I'll have any exposure here. Here's our next page. They want to know details about the breach. So as you become aware that there's been a disclosure that may possibly be tantamount to a breach, we need to be really careful in how we're documenting, okay? So if an employee explains that they somehow took information home or out of the practice, first off, we want to know, are you authorized to take information out of the practice, whether it's a laptop or uh, a thumb drive? And we want to make sure that that, that is uh, protected anyway. If a laptop, well, why wasn't it encrypted, the information, and why wasn't it password protected? And what other protections do we have on there to uh, protect us from a potential breach? So they report the breach. When did the breach happen? Well, let's say the breach happened on Monday. and uh, it ended because we found out about it on Friday. We discovered it. The next week, employee came in and fessed up. It, it ended, the, the discovery date ended there. There's only two people affected. Actually, let me show you the large one. Let's see, 502. 500 or more, because they're going to ask about the notice. We're going to say there's a loss. We lost a laptop, okay? There was clinical demographic information on there and demographic. Let's say that there's lab results. Uh, address, date of birth, name, social security number, and we're going to say uh, brief description of the breach, lost laptop, safeguards in place. Now this is important. They want to know what do you have in place right now. Well, we're going to say we have privacy rule safeguards because we have training and policies and procedures. We have security rule because we've done a risk analysis and we also have in place our security rule policy. We have physical safeguards. We have passwords and workstation security. We have security rule technical safeguards. We have access controls. We know who can access stuff and who can't. So we're moving on. We've done our individual notice. We've done our substitute notice. And we did our media because we had over 500 people. Or we could say we're in progress of doing all these things. Or we'll tell them we will. Um, actions to be taken. What do we do in response? To this disclosure. So they're asking a lot of questions, and a lot of entities are not going to be able to say yes to a majority of these things. And if you were to say yes to a majority of these things, what's going to happen immediately is OCR is going to come and ask for written confirmation that you've actually done all of these things. So if you don't have these things in place, then you really can't even properly do the reporting, or if you do, the reporting itself may open you to potential exposure, which is not what we want. This Office for Civil Rights used to be a very um, amiable government agency compared to many of the others. They would come in and try to proactively help you get to the point of compliance. Their mandate has now significantly changed. And they are now tasked with fining and, um, and coming in more Gestapo style. So we want to make sure that we have everything in place in case we do have an obligation to make a report to them. So when they come in, we can show that we're operating compliantly. Another major reason why I am doing a, a presentation on HIPAA is because patients are a problem. We have certain people who come to our practices that are just nudniki patients. They're difficult. They cause issues for us. And it may only be 0.01% of your patient population, but we all know who I'm talking about. They're very, very difficult sometimes. And sometimes those difficult people try to cause problems for us. One of the easiest ways for them to cause a big problem for you is for them to report you to this agency for OCR. Because the breadth and scope of their ability to review preventative compliance that many of you don't have completely in place 
is very easy. They just have to make a phone call and they have to make an allegation. And that's the same coming from a former employee or a disgruntled employee. And this is one of the easiest ways for them to cause problems. Similar and akin to them contacting licensure. Now the reason why I think that it's very important for us to be aware of this is you're probably thinking, Jennifer, this isn't such a big deal. You know, I, I, I don't think the patients would know to call here. Well, they might because it has to do with their medical records, and it's a very easy thing to find online. So people also don't want to be charged for things. Patients look up this agency if they're having problems getting access to their records or if they're, having, if they're being asked to pay for their medical records, which, of course, if you're producing a copy of a record and if you're giving it to them on a disk or you're, you're charging for paper, you should be paid for that. I don't like my practices to feel that they should incur any additional expense with our shrinking reimbursement um, environment, I want you to be able to get paid for everything that you do and reimburse for any cost that you have. So you are authorized to charge patients for records. A disgruntled patient may be looking for someone to complain to that they're getting charged. That's one way that something can land on OCR's plate. Also, similarly, if there actually is a disclosure and patients are notified, they may be annoyed or irritated, and they may also make a complaint. So in those instances, it's easy for me to see where OCR could be contacted. And OCR is going to have a record, of course, of the complaint. And if they're at the end of the year then not getting the, um, the, the notification from you that corresponds with the complaint, then that in itself can give rise to a potential inquiry from OCR. So yes, today's lecture was um, uh, advertised and, and, uh, and given because of the uh, upcoming obligation for the annual um, notification, and I think that it's important to highlight our deadlines on an annual basis to remember for proactive purposes. Business associates we talked about earlier, and I said that they are um, implicated under HIPAA, and they are because they have access to protect the health information. Um, the covered entity, as you see here, is ultimately responsible if there's a breach by the business associate to notify. However, you are authorized to delegate in the delegation to the business associate. If, if a billing company is the one who has a laptop stolen, we want to make sure, number one, and this is, of course, of the utmost importance, you must have a business associate agreement in place with your billing company, of course. I know that goes without saying. It's mandatory, OK? Um, in the business associate agreement, it should, it should have an indemnification provision, which if you get the free one online, um, from OCR or from wherever you're trying to pull it from, that document's not going to have an indemnification provision. Indemnification allows you to move the financial responsibility for a uh, breach of that agreement of the obligation of who maintains what um, to the business associate. So the business associate would take financial responsibility under that contract for a breach. That's incredibly important. Okay. In addition to that, you can now delegate over the notice requirement to the business associate. That should be documented in writing. And you should have in writing from the business associate, demand it from the business associate. Um, the steps taken, and you may want them to pay for their own counsel, make sure you have in writing that everything was done proper. That's what I would recommend for a breach. I'm going to go through some examples of exposure. And the purpose here is not to scare you, but it's to show you what's going on as far as um, activity by the Office for Civil Rights, and to give you some ideas in your own, um, your own uh, entity practices where you should be looking to protect yourself. This is a recent settlement uh, with Cancer Care Group PC. This is a, a very large oncology practice. Um, they have 13 radiation oncologists uh, in Indiana, and they just paid $750,000 to the Office for Civil Rights, um, a stolen laptop from an employee's car, there should be an apostrophe there, uh, was, um, was what happened here. And there was a tremendous amount of patient information that was on that laptop. Now the findings, this is what I want to highlight. It's the non-compliance, the non-preventative. The findings of Office for Civil Rights was that there was widespread non-compliance with HIPAA, the security rule. And the security rule is really geared towards electronic protected health information. OCR found that Cancer Care had not conducted an enterprise-wide risk analysis when the breach occurred in July of 2012, which, in fact, a lot of this guidance from the security rule and, uh, and whatnot was not required 
until actually September of 2013. So this kind of was a, not really a fair shake. What they're saying here, they didn't have a written policy specific to the removal of hardware or electronic media containing electronic protected health information, even though it was common practice in the organization. So <clears throat> Cancer Care Group was letting people take laptops and other um, electronic storage devices out of the practice and to different facilities. Um, and they didn't have anything in writing with the employees about who could take what and whose responsibility maintenance was. They may not have, have had passwords, I'm not sure. Um, they didn't have encrypted backup data or encrypted data. Uh, so there was a real issue here. They, they didn't show a cognizance, uh, any aware, awareness of their requirements under HIPAA. And I think that's really what PO'd um, uh, the Office for Civil Rights and, and gave rise to a, a large broad scale review here and also a major, major fine, three quarters of a million dollars is what they ended up agreeing to, um, which is obviously a tremendous amount of money for any organization. St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, um, this is also a recent settlement, had to pay $218,000. And what happened here was in 2012, this was a whistleblower complaint. They received a complaint of noncompliance from the workforce members that they were using an unsecured internet-based document sharing application to store documents. Now, why am I highlighting this? Many of us are looking for electronic solutions to send images or records or even emails. We have an obligation to make sure that we are using protected mediums. Now, there aren't any rule of thumb litmus test, definitive lines I can draw in the sand for you on what that means. And I'm sorry. That's going to be very frustrating. But my answer to you is you have to make sure that you vet the outside vendors and the software applications that you're utilizing for your practice. We want to make sure that everyone we're bringing in has some sort of claim or by some authority has been designated as being a secure um, vendor for our use. So for instance, Google, email, has certain uh, protections in place, certain encryptions that they claim. They will not say that they are necessarily quote unquote HIPAA compliant, but if you speak with quote unquote experts in the industry, they will tell you that the encryption and security of that system is a well above exceeds what could be reasonably interpreted as needed for HIPAA. Um, and so that's really important. And possibly in the future, I'll try to get on our listserv, if anyone's not a listserv member that's listening, just email me and I'll add you, um, some, some uh, industry experts to speak on this information and what is needed to make sure you're secure enough. This was a, a stolen laptop. Um, uh, Hospice of Northern Idaho paid OCR $50,000 for failure to conduct an accurate and thorough analysis of the risk to the confidentiality of electronic protected health information. They found they did not adequately adopt or implement security measures. So again, it's not that there was a stolen laptop. It's that they did not address the breach. Because here there is a breach, definitely. Um, and there would have to be notice provided to the individuals. And they also should have had in place um, uh, just more, more paper, which I know none of you want, but that's what they had to have. I highlight this case, number one, because we love to see health plans get in trouble. And number two, because it's an area that's kind of a unique thought process on where your protected health information is stored. Here, Affinity returned a copier machine without erasing the stored data. Of course, our computers are, are smarter in ways than we are, and the memory capacity, obviously, they, everything that's copied in this machine was still on the, uh, the drive that was in there, and it wasn't erased. So Affinity was hit with a $1.2 million assessment for failure um, to, uh, to properly protect against the disclosure of information when they return the copiers. So know where and when you have a responsibility to protect, report, and address HIPAA exposure lesson here. This is a dermatology practice that pays for a stolen thumb drive, um, also uh, $150,000. And the citing was for failure to conduct an accurate and thorough analysis of 
potential risk and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality of DPI. Um, so as we say in healthcare, this is from the Office for Civil Rights, they're being a little cheeky. They're saying an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, that is what a good risk management process is all about. So we need to make sure that we have our written policies and procedures and that we're training our workforce. So here's a question some of you may be thinking. Why did you make a big deal about annual reporting? You only spent one slide on it and it seems to be for small infractions, right? Well, the purpose of this webinar was to highlight, as I said before, that we regularly have to visit um, our obligations and make sure that we're calendaring and scheduling compliance into our busy days. I know it's one extra thing that none of us really want to take the time to do. We have enough to do between the paperwork on getting paid and running our actual practice. But unfortunately, this is um, uh, the new reality that we do have these obligations and uh, some of the requirements are new. And um, we have to make sure that we make the time when we accurately address. So we want a, pro a proactive approach to HIPAA protection. We need to understand our reporting requirements, which we went through today. We need to properly train our staff to identify and properly report breaches. And again, we're not going to use the word breach. I shouldn't have used it here. But disclosures, disclosures that may have been unauthorized. And we want to make sure we do a proper assessment um, internally and also with our outside counsel, our healthcare attorney, to make sure that we have a proper risk assessment uh, done. We want to implement our policies and procedures addressing HIPAA exposures, and we need to have our team in place to address any potential breach. So if you don't have a healthcare attorney that you're working with, you should. Okay? Your attorney, like your accountant, is a team member that you need on call just in case, uh, so that way you know where to ask these questions to. Um, in addition to what I've highlighted here, and could should be its own uh, webinar that possibly we'll do in the future, is Security Risk Assessment Tool, which is an online tool that the Office for Civil Rights and the Office for uh, Health Information Technology have uh, coupled together and put together an online survey that you can go through. It's an interactive questionnaire, and it goes through the physical administrative and technical safeguards that you're required to have in place um, in your practice pursuant to the security rule. So this is as of September 2013. And you can go through one by one and see if your, um, your actual hardware in the office um, and your actual office meet the physical safeguards if you have locks and password protections, things like that. And then also it has for your software you're using um, an assessment on whether or not that meets the mark and is secure enough. And that is an exercise that I recommend practices go through internally. Um, also, you could engage, obviously, with your healthcare attorney and your IT vendor, um, who, of course, has a business associate agreement in place because he or she has access to your, uh, your protected health information. So that's our information uh, for today. Many of you are on our listserv already. If you're not, please feel free to sign up. If you have any questions for me, you can contact me at any time. Um, I'll say it again, but I think many of you are aware. I do accept general questions uh, from, from our public, our community, that I use for free. Um, I answer for free and I use on our free listserv. Um, if it's a specific question that really requires retention, um, then of course I do tell you that. And um, we would have to have our, our own situation on the side where, of course, you have to retain our firm and, and uh, we would have to be paid uh, to answer the question. But we do try to answer general questions for the benefit of our community, which we view as the national practicing provider um, and uh, affiliates associated with, this, with helping providers practice. And, um, and we're happy to assist. So I want to thank everyone for joining me today. There will be a survey that goes out after. Uh, the end of our of our webinar, which is now, and I would appreciate if you would answer. I'm asking you what other topics you'd like to learn about, and um, thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Bye bye.